Joining us via the Skype line at this point in time, our Band of Brothers interview for the day, Peter O'Meara. Let's uh, let's talk Band of Brothers. It's been 10 years since this uh, came out. Uh, did you have this feeling that uh, when you guys were making this, it was going to be not only such a big hit to begin with, but it would carry weight uh, so long after it was uh, premiered and showed on HBO? Great question. I stood on, I can tell, share with you the, a very uh, potent moment uh, of being on Band. It was my last day. It was November 24th, and I stood on the set uh, at Hatfield um, Air Force Base, Aerospace. I was looking around, and there was this just huge sky, like something from, from a John Ford movie, just epic mm -hmm. with the clouds. And when you watch Ron, I've been on your website, and I've just, I'd never seen Ron's behind-the-scenes uh, video before, and I've been watching that. And it's fantastic, because it just brings it all back to me, what it was like to be there at the time. And if you look at the sky, that very dark European rolling clouds, um, you can see it in, in his videos. But I remember just standing there and taking this in, and just this extraordinary feeling that nothing I do is going to match this incredible event that I've been part of. And, and it was a sense of like, wow, I'm so grateful, this is so amazing, I'm sad to leave it, and what do I do now? What can possibly uh, equal this, um, that this moment? Like, and I remember sharing this with one of the producers at the barbecue last year, I said, listen, I just have to tell you that I, I was so overwhelmed by by what was going on and what I was surrounded by. Uh, and it really changed me as a person. It really did. It's had such a powerful effect on my life. Now, uh, when you were cast as uh, First Lieutenant Norman Dyke, uh, mm. we, we've heard so many other stories about uh, uh, going in and reading uh, and then getting callbacks and repeated callbacks and reading for like 17 different places before they, before they figured out that's who they were going to uh, saddle you with, if you can look at that in a good light. Not saddle you with, if that was the part you're going to play. Um, do you uh, have the same similar experience, or do they just look at you and go, oh, you look just like Norman, you're in? How did that work? I had read, um, I'd been in the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I was doing, and I'd heard about Banner Brothers, and I was like, no way, there's a World War II series happening, I've got to be in this, because my dad's a big history buff, and I'd grown up with, I'd grown up wanting to be an American soldier, basically that's what I'd wanted to, to be, I remember being at the bottom of my garden, having reenacted the Pacific, all by myself, and um, just like, having, you know, blown up warships all afternoon, and going inside to the house, and just feeling like, yeah, save the world again, fantastic. Um, that's what I, you know, that I, so when I heard that this series was happening, I was, I was going to just do everything I could to get in on it. Um, um, and so for, so for a guy, like for a boy, you know what it's like, you're like, what, they're doing, it's war, and it's your, you're going to have to, you're gonna, you know, you're going to get to do this and on camera, fantastic. Um, so I, I, the fact that I was in the RC, I was playing Edmund at the time, I, I had been understudying Edmund, and I, the guy who was playing it put his neck out, and so I got to go on at Stratford upon Avon. That gave me a little bit of, um, they had done most of the casting already on band, but I managed to get in with Debbie McWilliams, who usually cast the Bond movies, and was doing some of the initial casting for band in London. And she said, oh, you're, you're really good, your accent's really good, you should come back. So then I came back and I met, I read for, for Meg, uh, Lieberman, um, and they gave me Spears to read. And here was Spears, you know, this very kind of sinister character. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I went in and I kind of did my best. Um, I, I did uh, Marlon Brando from Apocalypse Now, a kind of interpretation mm. of Spears. Very deep and heavy and slow and kind of, and I guess it was totally wrong for the role. But anyway, um, and then... So time goes by, I didn't hear anything, and uh, I'll let you in on this. I had the sides for Spears, and I slept with them. I used to, like, I was so, in my heart, I was like, wow. please, God, please let me get this. This is, you know, this is, I really want to be part of this story. So um, eventually, I got this phone call that, yes, you've got it, and it was Dyke, and I couldn't find any sort of reference to Dyke. Who? Who am I playing? Well, what is? And then the script arrived. And I, my heart sank a little bit because I thought, wait, where's my great heroic moment of coming over the hill with the machine gun? Where, where's, where's the, who's this guy? This guy, like, dike, dike yawns and walks away. And it was sort of obvious that they do, they wanted to kind of brush him under the carpet and, you know, they kind of wanted him to dike him, he screws things up and then he leaves. And, uh, 
So I was a bit like, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to be part of the great surge or the great party. And I, I'd asked, could I go to boot camp? Could I please go to boot camp? And they said, no, you don't get to go to boot camp because you're a replacement officer and you're not part of the whole thing. So it's like it's sort of a feeling of there's a great party going on and you're not really going to be part of it. But you maybe can come in in the middle and, you know, you know we'll, we'll see. We'll let you know how you can, you know, there's a bit of that. That's what it felt like. God, so, so That would be so hard to do. Knowing that uh, you, you you have your heart set on exactly the opposite of what you're actually going to be in reading, you know it's like I, I'm going to be the hero, and you walk in and go, "Wow, this is uh, this is I, well, I'm going to be able to play this well because disappointment is going to be red on my face no matter what I do." Well, no, because well, you know, here's the lesson that, as being an actor, and I've done mostly theater. I've done no camera stuff at all. I've done no drama um, to speak of, and so getting there, who do I, I meet? Like real Americans, real real American actors. I mean, you, when you're with Neil McDonough or Matt Saddle, Matt Saddle or, or Ian Bailey or you know, those guys, man, they're so vivid. Like, they are just on. And they are, like, Matt played Spears so well. I mean, it just look like there's no way that I would have been able to do that. He was terrific. Um, and so, but equally, I got to have my little bit. And so, slowly, I began to discover Dyke and I got to go, oh, hey, you know, I began to realize that actually I, what I've been given was in some ways a, a, a bigger responsibility. Does that make sense? Maybe like a different responsibility. I'm going to be the guy that that people don't like. That people uh, I'm the cipher for everything that went wrong. And uh, that that was difficult. Being a replacement guy coming into the show, you know, the the guys have been told, okay, you're going to have some replacement officers coming in now. Don't, you know, as they would have in, in the real uh, war. You, know, you had these replacement guys come in and they would just screw things up because they were green and they didn't know what to do. And so they, you were treated with a bit of distance. And so I had that initially. I was aware that there was a kind of like, you know, you were sort of, you weren't just going to get all friendly with everybody all of a sudden. You, you had to sort of earn your, your place. Um, but day one, I arrived on set and I and picture this, if you and I were to go now to an air, to a an airborne base. It'd be pretty intimidating walking in there. Oh, you know, without a open. doubt. So that's what it was like walking on the Band of Brothers. You've got this huge machinery. Everything's massive and there's guys marching up and down, drilling and everyone's lined up. And I've got my gear and my webbing and I put it on and I just thought, I wasn't sure, like, what's the tone? Is everyone fully immersed? Is everyone, are we doing American accents all the time? Are we speaking as we would have then? Or is it casual? Like, what's the what is the play here? And I just caught Dexter Fletcher, who I I had we had a friend in common, so I was able to sort of say hi. And Dexter's like, give me all of that, because you know he's got his action and everything. And they turn to Captain Diane and he goes, yeah, "Is it okay if I put this over here, there, Captain?" And then so it was like I understood it was it, it was a bit you know there's a bit of play. I'm like, okay, so I'm chill. I walked straight up to Captain Dye and I said, "Lieutenant Dyke reporting for duty, sir." And he went, "Very well, fall in." And I had no idea what he meant. Um, I was like, uh, well, okay. And I stood there, frozen in front of him for a beat, and went, um, where, where, do I, uh, where do I fall in, sir? <laughs> and, uh, stand, stand beside me, Dyke. And he, he was very much in the form of, you know, he had to work quickly with me, because they were, you know, we're playing catch-up. I was like, okay, you're going to be the guy. This is what you need to know. And the guys had had weeks of boot camp, but, you know, I'm coming in green, so you've got to quickly, quickly, quickly... You know, be absorbed as much as you can. And he was going to tell me who I was. You're an asshole, Dyke. I was like, oh, okay. And I, I didn't, I didn't want that. You know, they were, they, they sort of treated me like, uh, oh, I know who you are. You're, oh yeah, you. You're the guy who's going to screw everything up. And I just, I, I got very in, inwardly. I thought, all right, I realize I'm going to have to sort of isolate myself a little bit and just try and um, give Dyke some sense of. Um, I wanted people, you know, you gotta like him. You gotta, he's, has, he's a person. And he may have screwed things up, but he was actually just a guy that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He didn't want to screw things up. He wanted to be as heroic and brave as everybody else. Of course he did. Any of us would would. So that's what I tried to bring to it anyway. Um, but what a great buzz being around all those guys, man. And, and I've heard, I've been listening to your radio interviews just over the past few nights and hearing the stories of Captain Die. He's so funny. He is so funny. I'll tell you a quick one. Like when I'm at the gym or when I have some like physical demand that I have to get through, 
I hear him still in my in my head. I hear I hear this, and it always gives me that extra boom to go a little bit further. It always does. And if I'm getting carried away with something or like something's really stressing me out, I hear his voice because I remember this one day when I was just goofing around, and because there was an intense process being on band but there's lots of light moments uh, behind the scenes and I was goofing around and I just heard this voice over my shoulder go keep your shit together lieutenant and so that <laughs> plays back in my mind when I <laughs> god that's awesome uh, and, and now uh, can you uh, uh, give us one big line of Captain Dies in your Captain Die impersonation because it's not bad oh, no. my, yeah. my, my mind is nowhere near as good as Michael Cutlitz's but that one keep your shit together lieutenant oh yeah I remember it I just looked for a chair at <laughs> one moment. I looked for it because a lot of standing around, and you know, I needed it to get a chair. And I, he just turned, looked at me and went, "We don't play that shit, Lieutenant." Uh, <laughs> and and I, I remember just off the cuff, my remark and going, "Well, that's delivered in your usual charm. Thank you, Captain." <laughs> and he smiled. He smiled at me because I kind of worked out after a while that you could, yeah, there was a tough side, and he scared the hell out of you for a while, but then. When I watched the other guys, I realized he was a daddy. You know, he's a daddy. He loved he loved the guys. He loved us. Yeah. And he, uh, he had a soft side. Like, he'd be talking very sternly with you one minute. But if you brought your mother or a girlfriend to the set and said, oh, by the way, Captain Ty, this is, he'd turn and go, Dale Dye, hey, how are you? Doing a hell of a job. Yeah, great, great guy. He'd just turn into this sort of headmaster figure, you know, that was <laughs> soft, big soft. Oh, God, that's, uh, that, that cracks me up. Let me just take a minute and just say I'm so grateful to Ross and to you guys for putting this together. I think it's awesome. Um, you know, it's this is a story. It was never a TV show. It never felt like a show. It never felt like any other production. It was really emotional. And so we all have this bond. But because we're guys, we don't really need to open up about it that much. Mm. And we all carry this little part of that experience with us. And you putting this on and getting us all to just contribute and share our, our stories is terrific. What a great thing to do. It's just great to be able to talk about it again. So thank you. It's nice to be nice to be here. It's kind of like it's nice to to get it out and go through that pr thought process again and be in that place again because as soon as you start talking about it, memories come up. You you know, like you were saying, you know, the sky was a, you know, e everything comes back. Mm, totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, the clothes I used to you know we'd be there and um, we were wearing these incredible just what we were saying about like being a kid and being a soldier and suddenly here you are you're actually wearing the stuff and you've got the carbine and you've got the you've got your weapon and you're being trained and you're in your marching and you're singing we're singing the song uh, the songs as we marched I was just incredible it's like wow this is this is the dream I'm living it and then at night time you get into your bus and you go home and um I just hated going home. I hated getting into my normal clothes and going back to... Uh, it was just fun living in 1943. It was just fantastic. And uh, I loved it. I listened to music of the period. I, I did all... Lots of us did little research things for ourselves. And you'd be surprised at some of the stories that I've heard um, just from people, little moments. Here's one a really poignant moment for me was... Scotty, you know, is playing Malarkey. And he showed me... Um, um, I think it's a, it's a medal or it's some sort of... Um, it's a, it's a medal of some kind that Malarkey wore through throughout the war, and he sent it to Scott to wear during the making of the series. And when I saw that, it really came home to me the responsibility that we had to try and get this right. You know, to do to really honour it. That this is not just some acting gig. This is a a really a powerful thing to be a part of. Our dearest Ross Owen um, asks your character. Uh, was portrayed in sort of a negative light. Did you yeah. receive any criticism for that? I mean, it was because of the real events. <laughs> this, I, I couldn't redeem him um, entirely, much as I wanted to. Um, here's, you know, there's the real dyke and there's what really happened. And that lives in the memories of the real guys. And I, I don't imagine that I approximated the real guy my job was to do what was in the script and to interpret it my way. So I was not, I didn't have access to his real family. He was long gone by the time we came to making the show. And so, and there didn't seem to be much point in talking to them about this. So, and I didn't feel I really had the license to talk to Major Winters about it um, because I was coming in pretty quickly and just trying to pick up the pieces as we went. Uh, 
you know, on, the script was not great. The the script. The, here's the thing: the writers, certainly for the episodes I was in, they really looked out on having great actors. Damien and and Donnie knew the shorthand of their characters pretty well, so they were able to improvise off the lines and bounce around. I didn't feel I had license to do that. I just sort of kept. I played pretty much exactly pretty exactly actually what's on what's on the script it, word wise but all the stuff around it all the things where he's not talking the sort of sense of why is he walking away and and his his sense of distance and isolation and uh he's so different and so odd um all of that was stuff i brought to him and how much of that actually relates to the real guy i don't know when i met the real guys I remember walking to the room and I thought, oh my God, here they are, the real veterans. When they see me, they're just going to hate me because I represent everything that went wrong. I represent really painful memories for these guys. That's who I now represent. This is the story that I carry, right? And it's kind of, it's been difficult for me because um, it's been difficult because I kind of felt, well, am I allowed to be part of the band? Am I allowed to be part of the guys because of who I played, you know? Um, and so I went, I met Major Winners, and I just I walked up to him and I said, listen, um, I said, excuse me, sir, um, I, my name is Peter, and I played Lieutenant Dyke, and I just want to pay my respects. And he put his arm around me, and he said, you did a great job. Oh. And, I, and I almost cried, and my eyes welled. And they're welling now as I tell you this. They're, um, it was, because uh, he has such a genteel honor about him. He, is, he has this incredible aura of just, he is a great man. I, I, you know, you know when you meet a great man. He is a great man. So, uh, I, I met the others, and they were very inclusive, and they were. It was like it was okay. I, I, I had the seal of approval. But one of the veterans came up to me and he said, "You know, Dyke wasn't as bad as you made him out to be." And I was like, "Oh, you know, sorry. I, I don't know what to say. You know, uh, because when as we shot the film, it, it was, it was very." They were, as far as they were concerned, as far as the storytellers were concerned, you know, he couldn't make him as bad as you as he can. He he was. They didn't really. They they had no empathy or sympathy for him at all. Um, so anyway, I didn't see any of the the band for for a long time until I turned on the television and everybody was at the Golden Globes and I was in Tipperary in Ireland where I'm from and I thought, what am I doing here? I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm I'm just going to come to LA and just see them. So I called Neil, and Neil was, of course, playing golf or something manly and sporty. And uh, like, sure, come on over, yeah, come on. So, so fox hunting, so uh, shooting deer or something. Anyway, uh, I, I came over and uh, I went to the Emmys. And so at the Emmys, I caught up with everybody the night before, and the veterans were there. And I met Frank John Hughes, who had was so different in person. I mean, Frank was Frank was. Um, a different guy on band. He was, he really, he's such an incredible actor and talent, and he's such a, a good guy. Um, it was so funny to meet him, you know, out of character, finally. And, uh, but I sort of reconnected with the band. We went to the Emmys, and there I met Hanks. And Hanks came up to me and he said, I'm so glad you're here. Be because, and because uh, he said, "I'm so glad you're here." Because again, that insecurity of like, I know, you know, I didn't do boot camp. Is it okay that I'm here? I'm not sure. Da, 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 you know, should I belong? Da, 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 da. I'm not one of the core guys. Da, 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 da. And he said, "I'm so glad you're here. You did a great job." It was just effusive and kind, and um, it was wonderful. That was another kind of seal of approval of, "Oh, okay, you did a good job. You're you're one of us. You know, you're allowed." And so, but I I, I didn't see anybody really after that for quite some time until I did this little movie but and Ross McCall was on it. Ross was the lead. And the moment we saw each other, Ross was just like, Brother, where have you been? And it's and it's been it's just lovely. It's really lovely. So I've been to two barbecues now and I instantly it's so emotional when you're there. I always think, well I'm just a sentimental Irishman, you know, that's just me. I'm the I'm the only one who feels this way. But but I'm not. I'm not. The others do feel it. They mightn't tell you that, but they, they do. Um, so last year was our tenth. You know, this year rather was is our tenth anniversary. We got some um, some uh, dog tags made up that said tenth anniversary, ten year reunion. Wow! That's and the first uh, I've heard of that. Wow. Yeah, and and when you look at like the cast, like when I think of all the people that were in it, incredible talent that was on the show, I feel really fortunate because 
those guys just make you look good. You know, no matter what I did, I was they were we were they make you look good. But also not just the, the cast, not just the cast, but the um, the technical side of things. Uh, here's a quick story. We went to do ADR. A lot of it was ADR, traditional dialogue recording, where you go in and you voice over what you've already shot, and um, just to get better sound quality on it. And we were in Elstree, and I walked across, and there was a, these very genteel English boffins uh, working in front of a giant, like cinema size screening of Band of Brothers, and they're putting in, they're folding in uh, the, the sounds that you take for granted, mm. and. The one they were working on, because the sound design on band is pretty spectacular, and that's what they were doing, but they were doing gentle things that you wouldn't even notice. They were putting in the rustling of trees uh, as the parachutes fell, as the guys parachute, they land. There's a lot, there's some trees and you know grass and those little sounds that you would never pay attention to, you wouldn't even notice them. But they were spending ages crafting these, layering them, getting them just right. And, should, should we try some of the other trees? Um, what else do we have? Let's try, do we have any beech? Well, let's try some beech. How about some oak? And uh, oh my it's God, that's awesome. folding, folding in these like beautiful sounds. Like they play them, go, mm, yes, that sounds about right. Let's just try and get that in. And just this, the attention to detail that everybody put in uh, behind the scenes is what makes band so special. You know, it's really an example of a, a, a work that tr is bigger than the sum of its parts. Everybody put in their piece. Everybody played th their role and contributed. But the end product transcends all of that. I feel. Oh no, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and I've I've told everybody that I had an opportunity to speak with so far. Um, what you guys have done uh, it will not, and and I don't think can be reproduced ever, uh, because it is just perfect because of the attention to detail, because of uh, the 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 months on end of casting the right people for the right jobs, uh, and and your portrayals were, uh, well, perfect. I, I can't think of another word besides yeah. perfect. Yeah. I mean, that I on the money on 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 occasion you can watch a movie and you'll be like, oh, you know, he'd be really good in this part, and you can think of somebody else that could play that part. I can't yeah. do that with a single person in Band of Brothers. I can't look at Band of Brothers. And I've seen it like five times from start to finish. I cannot look at that and go, oh, you know, who would be really good as uh, Spears? Yeah, right. it's not going to happen. Uh, you, yeah, you, you, you draw a blank because everything that you guys did was absolutely top notch. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I look around, and I, it's a testament to Meg Lieberman, actually, who put it all together uh, casting-wise, and that they they just, I mean, everybody just is their guy. What's funny is, you know, I, Peter, believe that if I were in that situation, or, you know, that we'd all want to believe that we're, we do the right thing. This is, um, come up, we'd all do the right thing. We'd all step up. We'd all behave perfectly in a battle situation. Um and, and Dyke didn't, but I'm playing Dyke, and so that's what I'm associated with. So when Neil sees me, <laughs> see, I'm convinced that he thinks that that's who I am. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's the guy who let us all down. You know, I, in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, like, D I'm not him. I'm somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that was a character. Let him alone. It's a character. Give me a break. Anyway. Oh, that's um, awesome. Because he'll say to me, you know, there's a there's a role going in this other movie that uh, you know there's a kind of weaselly guy. You'd be good for that. He said that to me one day, and I was like, "Is that how you see me?" Is like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, from now on, your typecast is a Weasley guy know. who's cowardly. They, uh, I guess they wheel me. I, I guess the the next uh, the next role that you're up for is the, the lion in the, the new Wizard of Oz. Is that where we're headed? <laughs> I wish. Oh boy, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Oh my I god! Have, uh, I just re reminded. I was on your side. Are you interviewing George Kalo? Uh, yes, next on the twenty second. Uh, next week, please give him my best. Oh, absolutely! My warm regards. He's a great guy, great guy. Um, he uh, he would just call me LT for the whole thing. Okay, LT, shoot thing, LT. Yeah. He was he was really fun. Um, yeah, God, I loved everybody on that. It's such it's such a great. So let's see who I can tell you about. Because if you think, I mean, look at the talent that's gone on to do great things. Tom Hardy is currently enjoying a mega movie career. He was on it for two episodes. Michael Fassbender is a fast-rising movie star. And Michael, being you know one of the few other Irish guys on it, I just remember meeting him, and he's so quiet. And uh, it's the quiet ones you got to watch. Um, he was, you know, uh, he, was, he was a great guy. Um, it's just fun to see everybody do so well. It's actually one example of you know, because we're all we all share this 
this experience that when any of us succeed or pop or do something else, there's always a feeling of like, yeah, good for you. You know, it, it's a great feeling, actually. A little part of you ascends with them, um, if that makes sense. That's, you, know, you applaud them. Oh, oh yeah. Well, and next week we're talking to Scotty Grimes again. Uh, my, my first moment with Scotty was, because then, you know, it's hard to work out who is the genuine American and who was the sort of fakey American. And, uh, so I, I, and Scott, having red hair, you know, he could have been, well, he could have been Welsh. Right. As proved in the recent Robin Hood movie. Um, I, so I said, oh, hi, I'm Peter, and where are you from? And he goes, I'm from Birmingham. <laughs> uh -uh. So he's, he's, a, he's a joker. By the way, I mean, you've never met a funnier bunch of guys. Every For all that, here's the one thing about band is like people go, right, you're Band of Brothers, so you're the drama guy, right? You do drama. Huh. You don't do any comedy. You're not funny. You're not funny. You just do drama. And so it's been a kind of, uh, it's been hard in Hollywood to like try and, hey, get seen as as funny as comedy. Those guys are some of the funniest people you will ever meet. Um, Franchise Hughes, Rick Gomez, uh, just so fun. Neil, hilarious. And Ross McCall, of course, just very funny. Just really good laughs. And uh, funny guys. I'm surprised we haven't seen more comic talent out of them. Well, and Scotty uh, let, speaking of being funny, let's talk pranks. Uh, did you play some pranks uh, while you were on uh, uh, on set, or did you have pranks played on you? Or did you witness any? Yeah. No, no. Um, let's see. Not not me specifically. Me, you know, because of who I was playing, I was a little removed, and it was a bit hard for them to get a handle on me. That makes sense. And 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 uh, I was kind of aware of this sort of distance as I say, between us. Um, but we would, like, I, Donnie, Donnie was kind of intense, actually, to be around. I'd never been around someone like Donnie before, who, who was, he was very kind of, you weren't sure, it was all a bit Irish in that you weren't sure if it was going to be, it could all go horribly wrong at any moment. Like, he might throw a haymaker or he might shake your hand, you know? Um, and then gradually, you know, we warmed it. He would, he would call me, hey, Lieutenant Mike. Lieutenant Mike, that's what he called me all the time. So we'd be behind that, we'd be behind that haystack. I just remember like a long conversations with him and Rick at the haystack, um, talking about you know everything. And uh, but I, can I think of pranks? Not really. Um, I remember the big charge scene at the end as we charge into Foy. That final scene was uh, a big deal. A lot of explosions going off. A lot of technical stuff happening. So you know, everybody had to be focused and be really together. And so for the director, David Frankel, who's gone on to do very well, and for that, that crew, it, it was a big deal. Everybody really had to keep it together. So as we, as we shot it, there was this just surge of energy and, and power. And, you know, it was a pretty, dare I say, a close approximation to the real thing. I, I don't know what the real thing is, but for us, if you're an art, I mean, it was just like boom, boom, boom. Those guns really went off, and you really felt it, and the ground shook, and you just ran. You ran, and you ran, and you ran. And I'm with Matt Settle, and Matt is, we're just, we're just running like crazy, and to get away from all these things that are like blowing up all around you. We got to the end, and they called cut, and it just this, this wave of exhaustion and euphoria and uh, hit you. It was pretty special, pretty magic, and we just laughed and laughed and laughed. It was fantastic. Giant smiles, like, what a moment. What a moment to be here right now in this place, you know, as young guys being soldiers, being World War II. It, this is the dream. This is amazing. Um, the other testament to Hollywood was the scale of things. That some, they, had, they built a, a forest in a big uh, warehouse, uh, an aircraft hangar, I should say, and it's about 15 feet of earth. It certainly felt about like 15 feet of earth, and they planted real trees into it. And you'd go in there, and they covered it in snow, and um, there was these l massive lights beating down on it. So it was actually quite hot, even though we had these giant greatcoats on, and we're supposed to be shivering away. And the scene where I, I'm with Donnie, um, Dyke talks to Lipton, Lipton's in the foxhole, that these large fans are going, and the fans are, are letting snow drift across the, the screen. And we can't hear each other at all. So we're kind of, you know, he's mumbling and I'm mumbling, and we don't know when to respond. And this, 
<laughs> and the director is shouting at me, and I don't respond well to being shouted at. So it was the little moment there, like, "Don't shout at me! Come and talk to me!" And he can't hear me because the fans are going. And it was, it was a bit crazy actually uh, at times, and very funny. I mean, you think about it, it's ridiculous. You've got these giant fans going, and we're supposed to act um, against them. Uh, a great, one well, a fun Hollywood moment. Um, there was a big rule: signs everywhere about. Uh, please do not bring your cell phones onto the set. Do not bring your cell phones onto the set. No cell phones onto the set because they emit a frequency that can set off the, the pyrotechnics. Oh. And that's very serious. Uh, I don't know if anyone's mentioned this before. but uh, I know. <laughs> this is a brand new story, I, man. I would love to know if that were really true or they just really didn't want anyone to bring cell phones on the set. Well, they, they were so serious about it that um, at one point the, the, the pyro guys walked off. And they were wow. adamant, that adamant, adamant that people understand that you know, you know, not to bring your cell phone, or if you bring it on, turn it off, because anything can happen. If that happens, if somebody's handling something, you know, it can go off in their hand, and they can get hurt. They can get hurt. So they had, I'd heard that they'd walked off, and so it was a big thing. And there were signs everywhere. You, the, the gate on, at Hatfield when you when you drove in, huge sign. Uh, where you changed, big sign. <laughs> on every, every place you went, big sign. Cell phones, cell phones. Here's again another reminder about cell phones. La my last day, they're just about to blow up. It's the scene where um, where where Gomez uh, walks away. You know, he throws the... the, the it's a, what a moment. He throws the uh, cigarette away, and kaboom, there's that giant explosion behind him, and he hits the deck. Well, they had rigged all those trees with these pyrotechnics so that they would explode. And they go boom, 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 boom. I mean, a major deal. And they rigged it all up. And uh, it's my last day, and I'm, I forget what the last sort of scene moment was. And just behind me, I hear this ringing, and everyone's face just drops. No, no. And, and I turn and I look, and whose jacket is it coming from? Oh, come on. Mine. It's no, really? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. God, I can't believe that I'm the guy. There you go, Lieutenant Dyke. That's me. Uh, I'm the guy. And the head of the pyrotechnic, the guy, I don't even know what the proper term is, but we, we took a little walk. And um, <laughs> we went outside. And he said to me, I said, listen, man, I am so sorry. It's my last day. I'm actually about to finish. I'm leaving. Please, please don't walk off. Please stay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And uh, I just remember pleading with him, please, for God's sake, they've got to make the day. Yeah. That's the whole thing when you're shooting something, like you've got to make your day. So um, he was, I mean, whatever I said worked, and they let, let it go. But that was a moment of, like, forget about pranks. Like, the more serious stuff was just, you know, being yeah. an idiot and, and, well. and forgetting. That, so, uh, that's, that's, a better, that's a better story than, hey, I uh, spit in somebody's, you know, I, I hid somebody's boot for a day. <laughs> um, uh, we, do uh, have, we do have a caller. Uh, uh, Jenny Lehman from uh, Minnesota is on the line right now, and she would like to ask you a question. Jenny, how you doing? Yep, I'm here. Good. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Peter. What's your question, doll? All right, my question is, um, what's your favorite episode or scene? It doesn't have to be one that you start in. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about the, I love nine is pretty great, isn't it? God, nine is so is so uh, moving. Um, my wife is Jewish and my children are Jewish, so that that was a big deal. Um, seeing that episode, that really hits home. Um, and scenes, I do love the scene with Compton and and uh, where, where Scotty reads the letter. I love that moment uh, um, where Compton has his breakdown and. And I mean that's breaking point is such a great episode for that. I'm very grateful to be part of it. And I love the the leap got scene in, in where you know, where he's beating up the guy. Oh, where he yeah. comes out of the room. That's just that's so powerful to me. But you know, the other thing about the series is so many people have great little moments. Like great like everybody gets a little moment somewhere. And that's that's what that's why it's so good. There's so many moments. The first couple of episodes trying to think even just you know in the first episode you know when you see those young faces staring at the screen young soldiers that's it really hits home you're, you're drawn into this world uh, automatically it's very compelling and it, when I watch Band of Brothers I actually forget I was ever in it I don't you know I forget all this technical things that I know you know I'm carried away into the story that's an extraordinary testament to, to, to what it is do you, do you get shocked when all of a sudden you see your face it's like oh there I am <laughs> 
I will tell you, I've definitely had moments like, wait, was that me? That was me. Oh my God, that was me. Um, I, 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 one of the, the first scene where Dyke comes in is at the end of Five, and that's which is Tom Hanks' episode. But Tom was in, um, he'd gone off to do Castaway, so they had to tag in this little bit at the end where Dyke arrives. And so we had to shoot this late at night, and it was the first shot that I had to do. And it's about 10 o'clock at night, and the people are kind of moaning at this stage. Like the crew are like, oh, I want to go home now. Oh, I've been doing this for ages now, mate. Oh, come on, what we got to do now then? Oh, we got to do this scene where, like, where Dyke arrives. And so and I'm Dyke, and I'm very nervous, and I've never done anything like this before. And Damien and Neil have seemed very seasoned. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so um, if you look at it, <laughs> I, I just raced through the whole thing because I'm, I'm, I'm keenly aware of, here's what's going on in my mind, is like, but what if they run out of film? I don't, wanna, I don't want them to, uh, to run out of film. I'll just be as fast as I can and, and everybody will be able to get home and you know, everybody will be happy then, right? <laughs> so, uh, when actu- uh, so actually, after, well, the lesson I learned was, no, you've got to take your time. You've got to really um, pace yourself and and earn your moment and there were so many learning lessons like that about being an actor on camera that I learned on Band of Brothers uh, just watching the other guys and, and uh, experiences like that so if you see episode 5 at the very end Dyke arrives but it's so quick it doesn't really register and uh, the lesson to me was you know take your time ease in it's okay you're going to be okay excellent so, mm-hmm. Je- the, does that answer your question Jenny? Yep, but before I go, I just want to say happy Hanukkah to you and your family, Peter. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Happy Hanukkah to you. Thank you. All right. You guys are uh, part of the, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen uh, uh, anywhere, and uh, I, I am just flabbergasted that uh, we've been able to talk with so many of you. I, I, I think that's what I mean. Like Everybody shares that moment of feeling like this really was special. It's not just me thinking that it was special. It really was. And that's why I'm so delighted to see that so many of the guys have come forward and say, yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's do it. You know. Now, uh, so one of the questions we haven't talked about yet, and it's one that comes up all the time because it's such an important uh, uh, attention to detail kind of uh, uh, topic since you were a replacement lieutenant and you came in yeah. halfway through, uh, how did you like those boots? <laughs> they were agony, man. They were <laughs> agony. Oh, boy. I heard that Matt settled. Maybe he'll tell you this. I heard he burnt his boots at the end of it. Um, yeah, man, they were rough. I, I can still feel the pain. Do you, uh, do you still have them? No, I don't. I do have my watch, and I have my dog tag somewhere, and I have my ring. I don't know where they are. I think they're in Tipperary. Um, but I don't have my boots. They made the ring specially for me. It was made for my fingers, so I, wow. thought, I felt I felt legitimately right to, to have it. Your dog tags you get to keep, and the watch I thought, oh, come on, it's a beautiful watch. You know, why not? No, um, no, I, the, the ring I, is I, that the, is that the the West Point ring? Yeah. No, does it actually look like a West Point ring? Did they did they get? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They got everything. I mean, they did everything. Everything is exact. This is the incredible thing about that production is you know everything down to the toothpicks were spot on. You know, like were exact. And you know, reenactors that I've met or people who are part of historical societies are they love band. And one of the reasons is because it is so accurate. You know, the detail, the attention to detail is so exact. Well, I, uh, that's. Uh that's totally awesome. Here's some of the stuff that was filmed that never got into the show was there was a sequence where Dyke leaves at the end, and you know it's this ignominious thing. He's he's leaving, and they filmed all the guys in the trucks pulling out of Foy and just staring at this guy in a jeep being driven out. And so I had to sit there, just looking dead ahead as they drove this jeep out, and all the guys were in the jeeps. Just uh, and they took shots of everyone, just watching Dyke leave, watching this guy who had, you know, really damaged them uh, leave, and they they didn't put it in the show. I guess there just wasn't room for it. But consequently, people then think that the Dyke character died uh, at Foy, and that's not actually what happened. What happened was he got a promotion, got a desk job, and a promotion. Um, another tragic example of the other side of the military, you know. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> Incompetence of the top brass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't handle this job. Uh, we found that out, so we're going to give you uh, more money to sit still. 
Uh, excellent Go choice. Even though uh, Meg did such a great job with the casting, uh, mm. besides the Spears character, because we know that that was what you wanted to uh, go with right up front. Uh, was there any other characters that you read that you were like, okay, this is I could do this one as well, or did you did you look at uh, anybody else's performance and go, I could play that guy as well, or or did you wanted to play a different kind of guy? Uh, did I want to play a different kind of guy? Yeah, I did. I, I did want to play a different kind of guy, but you know, some of the guys had were cast were in the whole thing for like you know, 10 months or however it was, and um, they didn't get the kind of moment that I get. I feel very fortunate that I got to play a role that is memorable, for better or worse, it is, it is a memorable role, and it pops a bit, you know, and so when you talk about Bandit, people will say, oh, what did you play in it? And I'll say, well, I play a replacement officer, and da 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 da, -da and I describe the sort of events of episode seven, and they go, oh, Dyke, you're Lieutenant Dyke? No way! Um... And it's, what's interesting to me is some people go, oh, you know, I really felt for your character. And others will say, I hated your character. And it's a sort of, it's a 50-50 divide. But the fact, that kind of indicates to me that I think I must have done something right. You know, that, um, that some people have empathy and other people are just so angry at him, you know. Um, well, I think, I think you played, uh, when, I, when I first watched it, I went through, well, first and second time I watched it, I had both of those emotions immediately. Uh, the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, that guy's a, oh, I hate him. You know, look what he's done. And then the second right. time I watched it, uh, I was more in tune with the entire series. I, I, w I was watching it for the second time. And when I when I saw that, I'm like, wow, he really, um, he really needed uh, more uh, support. I, I could empathize with it. And, you know, after the third or fourth times I'm watching it, I was just like, you know what? Um, nobody knows in their heart of hearts how they're going to react under fire literally automatic weapons fire artillery oh, yeah. uh, all of the above you do not know how you will react and that is a very common occurrence regardless of what you tell yourself oh i would never do that i would never do that it takes so much more to uh stand up and run than it does to hide you, and, That's it. And, and, you could, and you don't know which one of those guys you're going to be until you're hip deep in uh, a shitstorm. That's it. I, I have become friends with a, um, a leadership guru called Warren Bennis, who is himself a World War II veteran, and um, he uses the breaking point. Uh, when he lectures at West Point, and he's, uh, I think Obama has contacted him. But when we talked about bands, he said that he uses the breaking point as an example of how teams overcome a poor leadership. Because what happens is, you know, you have this leader who fumbles and falls and freezes in the moment, and the team organically overcome the problem, right? And that's an interesting example of that. And of course, I'm thinking, where are my residuals then? If you're playing it all over these places and people are learning from it, but anyway, <laughs> that's what we're all thinking. Oh, your um, residuals are deep in your heart, my man. Oh, yes, I know, I know. But anyway, uh, th I think that's that's a, a key moment. And you make absolutely nightmare. You make a very good point about that. Like, how many of us, if we were in that situation, would react, would do the, would, would know what to do, and uh, and would just reflexly get it right? This is why the word coward. I mean, people would say, "Oh, you're play the coward. You're the coward." I always had a problem with that. Even as we began to film film it, I knew, oh, people would refer to it as, oh, he's the coward. And I just had a big problem with that. It's not, it's not that simple. Knowing what we know now about warfare, knowing what we know now about battle and what it can do, the harrowing effects it has on, on the human psyche, that's not an appropriate word. It doesn't feel fair. You know, it's a much more complex... Uh, if you're really going to talk about it, then it's, it's a much more complex thing. And um, yes, what, what those guys must have gone through it's just so remarkable that, uh, yeah. So we we need to with the, with the gift of hindsight, I think, be a little kinder to those that perhaps did not, uh, so did not endure the crucible of that moment very well. Right, it's, a, it's an excellent way to put that, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, yeah, he is kind of a cipher for everyone who went through that, and Dyke wasn't alone in being a guy who you know, got it wrong or, you know, was not fully functional and hindered the progress 
Um, he was not alone. He wasn't the only guy. But in the in our story, he's that sort of central figure. But uh, as that he. Mm-hmm. As Band of Brothers is a, if it's a representative uh, story of World War Two, then Dyke is representing that uh, that sort of fault of, of man. Right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, no, what was your opinion of uh, David Schwimmer's portrayal of Sobel? Since both you guys played uh, the number one and number unsavory. two unsavory characters in the series. <laughs> Well, you know, David like did his thing. You know what I mean? And I just, uh, I just kind of did me on. Oh Jesus! And um, it's uh, yeah, it's funny. I I didn't meet David uh, on the show. I thought he was really good, actually. I know they they kind of rib him for not for not really doing boot camp, but you can do that when you're a movie star. You can, you know, you have that luxury. Um, and to be honest, how much did boot camp really make a difference for him? Um, I I, I right. don't know. For his character, I mean, for so the, Well, I think uh, the way that they set it up, it was perfect because they gave him all the benefits just like he would be hated already. And that right. was something we brought up uh, in a, a couple of the other interviews. We know uh, now that they did it on purpose, and Dale Dye takes full uh, credit for all that, by the way. He's like, you know what, we're going to bring Schwimmer in here, and we're going to make him not have to do a bunch of stuff so the other men will already hate him. And then when he uh, starts playing Sobel uh, in the show... Uh, the hatred will be real. <laughs> oh, really? Did he say that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Dale. Has, Dale totally copped to doing that on purpose. Has he been on the show? Yes, Dale? he has. Yeah, Dale. Oh, uh, Dale came in in uh, September. Oh, terrific! I'm glad. Um, well, there you go. That's interesting, isn't it? I didn't know that. Uh, How long was the uh, post production on band? Pretty, pretty long. Um, and they built a particularly ground, a new sort of. New fangled, new groundbreaking digital device. Uh, I've seen it. I've seen a picture of it. Actually, it looks like what you imagine an old IBM computer to be, um, like a, you know a giant, like what you see in seventies movies that represents computers. You know these giant things. It's like a fridge. And uh, so anyway, this thing was was built uh, to to for Band of Brothers, and they put all these. They tried out all these new processes uh, on the. On the post effects for the show, particularly the look, saturating the color out of the film and um, giving it a certain look and tone, and doing I think something with the focus. You know, uh, when the guys are running and the guns are firing, you know those little bits of dirt that are hopping up, right? That come into frame. It's so unique to Band of Brothers and to to Saving Private Ryan. They, uh, it's, there's this process that that they sort of created for that. This is my understanding. Ah, that's cool. Now, uh, was there any uh, uh, deleted scenes with uh, your character in them besides the leaving? Yeah. There was one scene where the bombs are, are... We didn't actually shoot it, but it was in the script. And it's where he gets the name Foxhole, Foxhole Norman because the bombs are dropping and he won't move. He won't refuses to move out of the Foxhole um, while... Well, something was going on, but anyway, that that was a sort of a, a, a big, expensive scene that was going to involve a lot of pyrotechnics that they didn't end up shooting. How would you sum up the heroes of Easy Company, the men you portrayed? Extraordinary, extraordinary men. I think what's most extraordinary is, you know, they they did what they did, and they what they did came from such a, a they're true warriors I mean true warriors and they did it because it had to be done they didn't do it for any reward they didn't expect anything at the end of it they did it because it had to be done and I feel that now the generations that followed we don't see the world that way everyone does something for reward they expect something out of it they expect some recognition or or you know financial reward or something they expect to be honored in some way. And those guys didn't do it for that. They just did it because it had to be done. Their world was so was so different. I mentioned Warren Bennis earlier. He's written a book called Geeks to Geezers, From Geese, Geeks to Geezers, which is about leadership. And um, that talks about leaders of now in our modern age of technology and leaders from back then. And what were the expectations that young men had back then and what are the expectations that young men have now? And nowadays, 
people expect to have at least you know eight or nine jobs before they're 30 to have done eight or nine sort of interesting things and but then it was like get out of school or get out of the military just get a job and you keep the job and then you raise your family and you, that's it you have loyalty to a company or loyalty to a you know you just expected to have one career and, and that was it so things were much more disciplined and there was a I think a stronger code of honor in their time and that's very you feel that when you talk about easy company they to me represent uh, they, they, they are the, the the definition of honor aren't they I mean they're so they have this incredible bond obviously after all they went through but you never get the sense that that they will ever feel boastful about what they did or that it had anything to do with heroism you know well uh peter i want to t uh, say thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule today for to come on here and talk with us uh, about band of brothers god bless you guys thank you so much this has been just a joy and so much fun thank you for bring, bringing back the memories thank you very much peter we appreciate the time